Good morning, and thank you for being here this morning. Um, as our first speaker, we are pleased to welcome Professor Dr. Elizabeth Nemeth. Now, um, Elizabeth Nemeth studied philosophy, psychology, and Catholic um, theology on the University of Vienna. Um, 1981, she finished her doctor in philosophy here. And in 1999, she got habilitated on the Faculty of Philosophy. From 2012 to 2016, she was Dean of the Faculty of Philosophy. Um, and today, Professor Nemet is going to um, share her expert opinion on um, the role of science in de democratic decision making with us. So, um, please, um, focus on her talk and help me giving her a warm welcome. Professor Nemitz. Thank you very much for this nice introduction and thank, thank, thanks to all of you for coming. Um, I had no, no idea how many people would attend this talk and therefore, um, well, I think the number of handouts I prepared is not um, big enough. I prepared 25 handouts. They should have been circulated already. Please share the, uh, the, the slides. Don't be afraid. I don't, uh, will not read all of them. This is partly uh, well, helping you to, to follow some of the, of the quotations first and second material for contemplation if you want to. Um, my my um, this overview I, will, uh, I don't have a real PowerPoint presentation, it's just the structure of my talk and the handouts, okay? I don't like the quotes, the many quotes on the, um, on the screen and therefore um, I prepared the handouts and this is going to be the structure of my talk and you can follow, um, you can follow it this way. So, um, I'm coming to my first point. Um, which was also already announced uh, in the abstract. Harry Collins, he's a well-known um, sociologist of, uh, of science in Great Britain, and his uh, collaborators distinguish three waves of science studies during the second half of the 20th century, each of which involves a specific way of looking at the relationships between scientific knowledge and political decision-making. Wave one he calls positivism, which is in his scale from 1950 to Kuhn. Uh, wave two he calls social constructivism, from Kuhn to 2000. And wave three is from 2000, which is uh, uh, Collins' own project to develop what they call a normative uh, theory of expertise and decision making. Uh, now I come to my first quote, you find uh, in your handout, I will read it. In the 1950s and 1960s, social scientists generally aimed at understanding, explaining and effectively reinforcing the success of the sciences rather than questioning their basis. Because the sciences were thought of esoteric and as well as authoritative, it was inconceivable that decision-making in matters that involved science and technology um, could travel in any other direction than from the top down." End of quote. In contrast to what, to what Collins calls the, the positivistic view, the second wave stressed that science was a social activity that depends heavily on extra scientific factors. The social constructivist's description of science was much richer than that of wave one. It was based on careful observation, Collins argues, and a relativist methodology. Wave two took a completely different stance than wave one on the role science can and ought to play in political decision making. It criticized top-down decision making and pled for including the democratic public in science and technology related decision making. However, Wave two brought about a particular problem, and this is now the problem uh, on, on which Collins um, is focusing uh, since 2000. I quote, 
by emphasizing the ways in which scientific knowledge is like other forms of knowledge, sociolo sociologists have become uncertain about how to speak, uh, what, about what makes it different. In much the same way, they have become unable to distinguish between experts and non-experts. End of quote. Therefore, it became almost impossible to spell out what the sciences respectively the experts' specific role in political decision-making uh, is and what it ought to be. I'm sorry, I'm a bit um, uh, sick and therefore um, I have difficulties to speak. Sorry about that. It is this problem Collins and his collaborators set out to solve. They want to give a normative theory of scientific expertise which can spell out first what makes science different from other forms of knowledge and second why this specificity justifies a specific role of science and technology in political decision making. Now I come to my uh, third quote uh, again from Collins. Wave three involves finding a special rationale for science and technology even while we accept the findings of wave two, namely that science and technology are much more ordinary than we once thought. End of quote. Today I would like to put this project in a historical perspective by confronting it with Otto Neurath's article from 1913 in which he discussed surprisingly similar issues. The, the article is uh, called um, the, Wanderer of, the Lost Wanderer of Cartesius and the Auxilia Mo Motive on the Psychology of Decision. I will put, it is from 1913, I will put the main focus on the philosophical and at the same time sociological diagnosis which Neurath made in 1913 and contrast it with Collins' views from 2002. That is to say that I will focus on the way they describe the problems they want to respond to. So I, will, I come to Otto Neurath and the Lost Wanderers of Cartesius. Um, let's, look, let, let's have a look on this article. In its first part, Neurath makes some points which sound as if they were taken from a manifesto of what Collins calls wave two of social uh, science studies. At the beginning of his paper, Neurath quotes a long paragraph from Descartes' Discours de la Méthode, which you find on your handout, I will not read it, on, uh, read it only at the beginning, in which Descartes presents the famous four maxims which he decided to follow in his moral and social life while he was searching for truth. For Descartes, those maxims are provisional because he assumes that when, as soon as definite knowledge will be achieved, those maxims could be replaced by certain knowledge. Neurath is particularly interested in Descartes' second maxim of these provisional uh, morals, which was, and this is now the beginning of quote four, to be as firm, as resolute in my actions as I was able, and not to adhere less steadfastly to the most doubtful opinions when once adopted, than if they had been highly certain. Imitating in this example the travelers who, when they have lost their way in a forest, ought not to wander from side to side. And this goes, uh, goes along quite a, uh, quite a while, and I think it's in itself a very interesting quotation. And by the way, the method, uh, Discours de la méthode is a, a re, still a very nice uh, piece of philosophy to read for anybody who is interested in philosophy and science. So Neurath praises Descartes, the father of rationalism as he calls him, for acknowledging in principle the necessity that we must act with insufficient insight. But he criticizes Descartes for not counting theoretical thinking among actions. While Descartes made a sharp distinction between thinking and action, Neurath argues the differences between thinking and action are only of degree, as he says. And now quote four, five, it was a fundamental error of Descartes that he believed that only in the practical field could he not dispense with provisional rules. Thinking too needs preliminary rules in more than one respect. The first reason that Neurath gives for this, for this necessity of provisional rules even in thinking, is that 
the limited span of life already urges us ahead. But there are also more fundamental objections, and this is now my uh, quote six, uh, to the Cartesian view. Whoever wants to create a worldview or a scientific system must operate with doubtful premises. Each attempt to create a world picture by starting from a tabula rasa and making a series of statements which are recognized as definitely true, and this was, of course, Descartes' project, is necessarily full of trickeries. The phenomena that we encounter are so much interconnected that they cannot be described by a one-dimensional chain of statements. The correctness of each statement is related to that of all others. It is absolutely impossible to formulate a single statement about the world without making tacit use at the same time of countless others. Also, we cannot express any statement without applying all of our preceding co concept formation. We can vary the world of concept present in us, but we cannot discard it. Each attempt to renew it from the bottom up is by its very nature a child of the concepts at hand. This paragraph of uh, Neurath's 1913 paper has become quite famous during the last decades amongst philosophers who have reconstructed the history and philosophy of logical empiricism. However, the philosophical historical research focused almost entirely on the epistemological impact of Neurath's article, but not on the way it addressed the relationships between science and political decision making. However, if we look at the actual paper, we see that the epistemological part, though very important, is relatively short, only one third of the article. When we take the whole article into account, it becomes quite clear that Neurath was not, sorry, was not interested um, in questions of philosophy of science as such, but rather in the way they matter in a broader context. Let me put in a nutshell, what, from my point of view, Neurath's Descartes paper aims at. Uh, it refuses a particular concept of rationality, which he calls pseudo-rationalism, and which, in his opinion, plays a destructive role, plays a, well, this is the whole, plays a destructive role uh, in modern societies. There are four, four points I would like to stress, and I, uh, I, just as an overview. Um, first, decision, uh, decisionism is a legitimate, limiting case of rational behavior. Modern life conditions suggest a wrong conception of rationality. This wrong conception is supported by the ideal of definitive truth, the Cartesian, the ideal of Cartesian or Descartes, it's the same. This wrong conception is, yes, uh, and fourth, pseudo-rationalism might undercut the possibility of rational action in modern societies. So, uh, I will uh, first of all talk uh, about the first uh, of the three of the four points. Neurath argues for accepting decisionism as a legitimate limiting case of rational behavior, both in the theoretical era, area and in everyday life. Decisionism, in Neurath's sense, means that under certain conditions, we cannot avoid taking a decision even if we don't have any rational reasons for it. Uh, see the quote of Descartes. In this basic sense, decisionism might appear to go without saying, at least in everyday life we, we know this quite well. Yet, from the psychological point of view, in um, uh, Neurath argues, it is not obvious at all, particularly in modern societies. Therefore, he wants to deal with the question how such a resolution comes about empirically, a re resolution without any rational um, base for decision. He focuses on a particular strategy of bringing about a resolution in cases in which we cannot reach a result by considering different possibilities of actions. This strategy consists in using a motive, now we are uh, at quote seven, a motive, um, which has nothing to do, this is a quote now, with the concrete aims in question. He calls it the auxiliary motive because it is an aid to the vacillating, so to speak. The auxiliary motive appears in its purest forms as drawing of lots. Um, 
yeah, um, I can I can skip the, the other parts of the of the quotation. In and now Neurath's main idea here is that in modern societies this type of auxiliary motives um, is not very popular. Why? And now I come to my to this second point. Um, Neurath holds that the social conditions of modern life urge people to assume a wrong conception of rationality, that is to say, a conception which does not allow for decisionism as a limiting case. Note that for Neurath, the auxiliary motive never replaces rational consideration of pros and cons. Neurath wants it only to be introduced where such con consideration does not lead to any result. Note that this can happen in both traditional and modern societies. And this, now this is in quote eight. Um, uh, I will not read all of the quote eight, but um, just a part. Also the traditional man sometimes becomes conscious of the difficulty of choice, especially when he faces actions that are not adequately determined by tradition. He also finds himself in a painful position if contradictory traditions exert their pressure on him. However, as it was end of quote, the, the actions of women and men in modern societies are to a much lesser extent defined by tradition and authority, Neurath argues. In modern societies, people, and this is now the first part of quote eight, are used to making a large part of their actions dependent on individual insight by the exact weighing and examining of means and ends in long, drawn out deliberations, end of quote. This tendency in modern societies does not only weaken particular traditions, but delegitimizes the very procedure of leaving the decision to any other authority than rational insight. Neurath's views of the nature of modern societies fit very well in the German sociology of his time. Neurath shared with Ferdinand Tönnies and Max Weber the belief that the process of rationalization is inevitable and that science will play an ever more important role in private and particularly in social life because instinct as well as religious traditions and other authorities, and this is now, now we are in quote nine, must fail with respect to the con complex rational relationships created by the consciously shaped institutions of the social order of modern technology. Therefore, it is inevitable that decision-making in modern societies relies as often as possible on theoretical insight. This, however, gives rise to a phenomenon which in Neurath's view is problematic, namely the belief that we can, at least in principle, leave the decision in all things to rational insights once and for all. And this is now quote 10. Most of our contemporaries rely on their insight and want to leave the decision in all things to it once and for all. Their starting point is the view that given enough thought, one could at least determine which manner of action has the greater probability of being successful should certainty be impossible. That there are cases in which one faces several possibilities of action quite helplessly is denied or declared so highly improbable that no sensible man need give it a further thought. Neurath called this attitude pseudo-rationalism and opposes it to true rationalism. Um, this is now quote 11, part one. Rationalism sees its chief triumph in the clear recognition of the limits of actual insight. insight. Um, I tend, Neurath uh, argues, I tend to, to derive the widespread tendency towards pseudo-rationalism from the same unconscious endeavors as the tendency towards, towards superstition. With the progress of enlightenment, men were more and more deprived of the traditional means which were suited to making unambiguous decisions possible. Therefore, one turned to insight in order to squeeze an adequate substitute out of it with all possible force. In this sense, pseudo-rationalism, a belief in powers that regulate existence and foretell the future, as well as a reliance on omens, have a common root. End of quotation. So for Neurath, pseudo-rationalism is a socio-psychological phenomenon. It is an attitude individuals develop in response to specific modern life conditions. But the story had al has also a philosophical side. 
and I will shortly come to this. A pseudo-rationalism, Neurath argues, is supported by a philosophical ideal of definitive true knowledge, which is based on the view of Descartes that in the field of theory, by forming successive series of statements then that one has recognized as definitely true, one could reach a complete picture of the world. This ideal, Neurath argues, is outdated. It has been destroyed, not by philosophers though, but by physicists and mathematicians who critically re-examined the basic concepts and theorems of their disciplines. The most important names for Neurath in this context are Ernst Mach, Henri Poincaré, and Pierre Duhem. And the respective philosophical keywords are underdetermination of theories by observational experimental data, so the emphasis on the constructive moments of theory formation. I will not read this, uh, this quote, it, it is quote 12. Um, this is also under determination of theories by observational and experimental data. Second, holism in the process of theory formation. These are uh, quote 13 and 14, and I will read only the quote uh, 13. Um, and, and this is from a really very, very nice, um, nice article by Rudolf Haller, the important philosopher um, of science um, in, in Austria who, who has died uh, several years ago. Um, um, and he, he did a, a really very good, and maybe I can, can even this, um, you said that we could put some things on, on the net, maybe I could, could give you a copy of this very good article on the discussions that the so-called first Vienna Circle had before World War I, and where especially the physicist uh, Philipp Frank and Otto Neurath, who was a sociologist and, uh, and economist, uh, played an important role. And I take now these quotations to characterize the philosophical uh, main points um, from, from this really good article of um, uh, Haller. So the quote 13 is, first, the, the idea of holism is that, uh, that First, there is no experimentum crutis which could decide the correctness of truth of one of two theories between we may choose for the explanation of one and the same phenomenon. And second, in, in both the testing of experimental hypothesis uh, of a theoretical sentence, uh, and, no, in both the testing of an experimental hypothesis and of a theoretical sentence, we confront the whole system of observations with that of theoretical sentences. This is the holism that, um, that uh, was especially, um, well, uh, for, for which especially Pierre Duhem um, has found the, the, the most famous formulation. The next point would be the conventionalist interpretation of theories. Here, the name of Henri Poincaré is the most important one. Yes, uh, this, is, this you find in, in quote 15, which in principle says that different axiom systems can be used for the description of the same structure, and the criterion of the selection of theoretical sentences can finally only be pragmatic, simplicity, convenience, etc. So this is this, also we had this holism, we have now we have conventionalism, and uh, I will read the, um, the next quote, 16, because there I think um, Haller finds a very good uh, formulation for the conclusion that is drawn from, from, um, from the, uh, what, what I have said uh, until now, namely about randomness and caprice in the formation of theories, as Neurath, uh, uh, Haller calls it. Um, the quotation uh, 16 is the following. If then there is no logical, deductive, or empirical, inductive necessity of preference in these most important steps in theory construction, namely the selection of hypotheses, if, as in the pragmatic conception of truth, subjective attitudes and circumstances form the criteria, then we must admit the place of randomness and caprice in the formation 
of theories. Many see in this the danger of a conventionalist interpretation of scientific research, but just this thought was accepted as liberating and used in the first Vienna Circle, particularly in the philosophy of Neurath." End of quote. However, despite the criticism from physicists and philosophers, the Cartesian ideal has, following Neurath, survived not only in the psychological sociological context, which we described above, but also in the field of theory. That is to say, the ideal matters also within science, in Neurath's uh, opinion. In his view, it makes a difference whether or not um, um, researchers recognize Descartes' ideal as a model uh, of what they are doing. Just as a side remark, for Neurath, the critical re-examinations of the foundations of physics a la Mach, Poincaré and Duhem became sort of a template for his attempt to re-examine the foundations of his own um, uh, discipline, namely political economy. But this would be a different story. This is not our story today. Now I come to, to, to the fourth point of this. Um, pseudo a conception of rationality that does not recognize the limits of insight might undercut the possibility of rational action in modern societies. This is the, 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 the thesis, um, um, well, one of the main theses in, this, in Neurath's paper. But how could pseudo-rationalism make rational action impossible? First of all, his, uh, Neurath argues that on the psychological, individual level, pseudo-rationalism leads partly to self-deception, partly to hypocrisy, which means that it ruins an essential, an essential precondition of rational thinking, namely intellectual honesty. And now we come to um, on the social and political level, and this is now again um, uh, quote 11, but part two. The pseudo-rationalists always want to act from inside and are therefore grateful to anybody who is able to suggest to them that they had acted from inside. Um, I think I even um, will read all this now because it's so funny, because it's so actual. Uh, this position of mind explains sufficiently the striking lack of criticism with which, for example, election speeches of parliamentarians are received. The listeners are glad, so to speak, if they can make up their minds in favor of something with a good consciousness. This desire is mostly of primary nature. If the speaker is aware of this fact, his action becomes a farce. His aim, then, is only to suggest rationality. The question now is what happen, What will happen if psychological knowledge becomes so widespread that most citizens see through the apparatus of such suggestions? If they do not return to superstition, to uh, instinct or to absolute simplicity, nothing re remains but seizing an auxiliary motive where insight does not reach far enough. So this is uh, um, the last point here. And I come now to my last part. Let me come back to the beginning of my talk and give a rough sketch, a rough sketch of what, in my view, Harry Collins and Neurath's diagnosis share and in what respect they differ from each other. First, what Neurath observed as a tendency of modern societies in general, namely to put science in an authoritative position in political decision making, um, has in Collins' diagnosis become a historical reality during the 1950s and 1960s. Maybe this is a point which I should stress because it's, it has, uh, I realize only now, it has not been explicit enough. And Neurath explicitly says that uh, it would be misusing scientific knowledge if we want to replace authorities, social authorities, uh, um, well, put, put uh, scientific knowledge in uh, the position of social of a social authority. This would be an ab absolutely uh, uh, catastroph uh, catastrophic misuse, which would um, would sort of um, uh, make make um, pseudo rationalism growing and uh, with with very very um, problematic uh, consequences. So uh, this is a common feature between Neurath and Collins. 
But what, what Neurath observed as a tendency in modern societies uh, has in Collins, Collins diagnosis become historical reality during the 1950s and 60s. This was the wave one of science studies when social ana analysts of science attributed to science an esoteric nature and credited it with authority in political decision making. Second, both Neurad and wave two of science studies are critical of crediting, crediting science with that um, authoritative position in society. They reject uh, this position by arguing that science is by far not as esoteric as many have thought it to be. Both of them stress that there are many historical and social constraints which make of science formation an enterprise that includes uh, randomness and caprice in, Neura, uh, in Haller's words, and is shaped to a surprisingly large extent by the social, cultural, and political circumstances in which the theories were developed. Third, Neurath and Collins would also agree that there are two levels on which the esoteric image of science can be called into question, namely the historical sociological research and its philosophical analysis. Of course, the historical sociological re research of science was before World War I in its infancy, but an enormous uh, amount of examples of the multiple inter interaction between social, cultural, and political circumstances um, uh, uh, between, yeah, and scientific theory formation was explored by authors since the 1980s, very famous authors in, in the studies on history, and, um, history of science. Um, the, the relevant names here, only a few of them, are David Bluer, Barry Barnes, Simon Schaeffer, Stephen Shapin, etc. Et and uh, uh, But one has to add that Neurath found um, that uh, already in Ernst Mach, there was a very, very interesting emphasis on the historical reconstruction of um, theory uh, formation. And so Neurath um, was quite, uh, quite uh, let's say, um, was not only prepared, but highly interested in looking at science from, from this um, historical and, of course, as a sociologist, also from a, um, a sociological perspective. And he made several, several um, uh, uh, suggestions for this. Now I come to my four, uh, yeah, yes, and the, f the philosophical arguments, of course, all, both of them accept that, that also philo philosophical analysis shows um, that this, um, uh, this um, image, uh, esoteric Im image of science that excludes social constra uh, constraints are wrong. And there, of course, for, for Neurath, the, the um, most important names were Machtwerm and Poincaré. And for, for Collins, it was uh, Kuhn, uh, Thomas Kuhn's um, uh, um, um, book on scientific revolutions, which, as you might know, uh, has more uh, affiliation with Neurath and logical empiricism than uh, normally is known. The first version of this book appeared in the Encyclopedia of Unified Science, um, which was um, uh, initiated, founded, and coordinated by uh, Otto Neurath, not, that, uh, not in 62 anymore, because Neurath died in 40, uh, 45. But, um, but, uh, but there's a, uh, and, and Neurath had for, for this encyclopedia, a very strong emphasis on the history of science. So there is a, there is a, a, a clear uh, connection. The fourth point um, of commonalities is um, they share, what they share is the normative dimension. Both of them are concerned about the role that scientific expertise ought to play in political decision making. So Collins' ideas on this subject are much more elaborated than Neurath's. Yet, in his theory of expertise and experience, uh, Collins suggests an interesting distinction that shows how close his concerns and those of Neurath's are. Collins distinguishes between two extreme formations of the relationship between scientific expertise and political decision making. He calls it the technocratic regime and the technological the technological populist regime. And this is now our, which one uh, under? Yes, the 17th, um, quote 17. Under a technocratic regime, 
the political phase would be do dominated by the technical phase. One has to say that before this, he distinguished two phases, namely the, uh, the political phase would, would be um, the phase in which the pol political procedure leads to a decision. The technical phase um, is characterized by uh, that um, scientific procedures produce scientific expertise. So this is, this is there are uh, two phases, and, um, and uh, just this is uh, the background for, for, for this, uh, for this uh, quotation. So um, under a technocratic regime, the political phase would be dominated by the technical phase. Uh, um, policy, um, Policy makers or those actors who act in the political phase can neither ignore expert advice nor can they refuse to act upon it. Political decision, decisions would become technical decisions. So this is tech, uh, this te technocratic regime. Under a technological populist regime, the roles would be reversed and the influence of the technical phase upon the political phase would be negligible. Policymakers would be in a position not to only refuse to act upon expert advice, but also to ignore it altogether. Now, of course, these are two, uh, two let's say, uh, extreme points, um, and, uh, which, which are, so to speak, uh, uh, limiting limiting cases of the, uh, the, the many possible constellations in which these two phases can interact. And in my view, um, Collins uh, is developing a very interesting framework in which this alternative is avoided. His, um, his project, while taking crucial insights of wave two on board, undertakes to spell out in sociological terms what the specific role um, is that science can play in democratic public decision making. Given this sophisticated project, is there any interesting perspective we can adopt from Neurath still here? To begin with, there's a very simple point. Harry Collins' mind overestimates the social impact of both wave one and wave two of social science studies. This could have to do with the notorious overestimation we intellectuals have of the impact of our work. From Neurath's 1913 point of view, it is the inevitable process of the rationalization of society that tends to put science in an authoritative position and at the same time engenders that broad cultural phenomenon of pseudo-rationalism, which imperils true rationalism. Therefore, for Neurath, neither the tendency to put science in an authoritative position nor the tendency towards rationalism can be overcome once and for all. It is, to a certain extent, intrinsic to the modern condition. So Neurath's 1913 diagnosis of the situation takes a broader sociological perspective than Collins, and he places more emphasis on the epistemological dimension than Collins. Neurath wants us, which means scientists and non-scientists, to learn a lesson which has been taught us by modern science itself, namely that even our conceptually and methodolo methodologically most refined insights rely partly on provisional rules and therefore can never count as definitive true knowledge. So in Neurath's view, the epistemological task would be, and it is a very difficult task, to develop a conception of knowledge, its provisional character seriously. This means a conception which conceives of the provisional nature of knowledge in general and of science in particular without even contrasting it with, it, with the ideal of complete <laughs> definitive knowledge. Um, Neurath's famous simile um, of the boat um, on which we move on, 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 um, on high sea is, um, is the simile for this. For Neurath, this would by no, um, by no means delegitimize science nor its role in public decision making. On the contrary, such a concept would be, in his view, the precondition of thinking clearly about its role. And th this is very close to, to, to Collins wave three, in my view. Uh, I'm almost finished, but for Neurath, there was still more at stake. From his point of view, a theory of expertise would not be sufficient um, as a response to the problems of rational decision making under modern conditions. He believed that people, scientists and non-scientists, have to become convinced that 
um, a rational conception of both knowledge and action can and even must renounce the ideal of definitive certainty. Only under this condition, Neurath held, rational consideration of public issue, issues would have a future in political life. Pseudo-rationalism is such a destructive force, not so much beca because the ideal of knowledge it endorses is wrong. What is worse is that it prevents us, scientists and non-scientists, from asking the question what it means to make decisions on the base of the best insight we have, which is no nonetheless not certain. Pseudo-rationalists assume that this question can be answered once and for all. Neurath believed that this assumption is, philosophically speaking, wrong and, politically speaking, a dangerous position to take. I think that much of Neurath's later work from the 1920s, the, the work which is much, much better known, of course, in the Wiener Circle, can be understood from this perspective, that he wanted to put this question on the table in both the scientific community and the public. His contributions to the debates of the Vienna Circle, on the one hand, can be inter interpreted as working on a conception of science that takes its, its intrinsically provisional nature um, as fundamental insight in epistemology and uh, philosophy of science. Neurath's work on the visualization of sociological facts, on the other hand, mm -hmm. intended to draw the attention um, of a broader public to that question. Neurath's international picture language can be seen as a tool for involving non-scientists and scientists in considering what it means to make decisions with the help of our best insight, even when this insight leaves us with more than one option. But this would be a too long story for today, and therefore I finish here. <laughs> Question and answer. Oh, yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, I think talking about rationality in a very general case is not very fruitful because rationality always relates to certain situations. So, in economics, by the way, I'm not a philosopher but an economist, uh, we talk about, uh, for instance, rational decision making in microeconomics by uh, relating to some kind of optimal calculus, maximization, etc. And the so-called rationality principle has nothing to do with rationality itself. It just maintains that individuals act according to the logic of the situation. And when we have or when we analyze rationality or rational, expect, uh, rational actions, in particular situations, for instance, the rational, uh, rationality of an action of an individual, we might find that what is rational on an individual level is totally rational on uh, an aggregate level. Because, as you know, the famous uh, example in, uh, in, in cinemas, uh, if uh, in my young days uh, women used to wear large hats so you couldn't see the screen and accordingly it was rational to get up. But in the end probably everybody would have stood up in order to see the mm. screen. So it depends much on the situation. The second point I have is uh, what is being discussed now as the uh, pragmatic problem of induction. That is the usual picture, and I think this is uh, uh, partly what Narad meant with uh, pseudo-rationalism, <laughs> is uh, that uh, once you uh, believe uh, uh, in uh, certain truths, it is rational to rely on theories and base your political actions on science, right? But it's completely irrational to rely on theories because the world may in disintegrate in the next minute. So it's completely irrational to enter your aeroplane believing that it will uh, work and bring you to your holiday uh, destination because the theories which are based on do not make any claim regarding the future validity. But I'm afraid these, these issues uh, 
that political actions are rational if they are based on scientific uh, views, on scientific theories, uh, is false because it's a justificationist argument. And in that sense, I think Renard was foreshadowing kind of non-justificationism, which later was developed uh, mm -hmm. uh, by critical rationalism and by Popper and the critical rationalism. So what is rational if it's not justificationism? It is perhaps that we need to evaluate the performance of theories, evaluate the performance of critical argument. If you have a justificationist argument, you end up in an infinite regress and end up in an authoritarian argument, perhaps dogmatically uh, limiting or shutting uh, uh, this argument. So rationality, as it seems, is the evaluation and the performance of the performance of uh, critical arguments, right? Mm -hmm. the, third, the third point I'd like to relate to is perhaps Narod's views were, uh, when they, uh, when they uh, were developed by Narod, were much influenced uh, by ideas regarding the planning debate, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, uh, the regulative economies uh, and the price regulations, etc., of war economies, right? So, probably uh, within the planning debate, it was maintained that it is possible to design institutions for the well being of humans and avoid that, uh, the chaotic. Uh, the chaotic situations raised by capitalism. Now, I was wondering whether uh, this is not pseudo-rationalism and that Nairat may be confronted with this idea of pseudo-rationalism himself. Yeah. Thank you very well, much. This is a lot. Uh, that, uh, I will, uh, will uh, answer only, a, uh, 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 well, I cannot answer every single point, but uh, I will um, will start with, uh, um, First of all, I think that uh, you're absolutely right that uh, talking about uh, rationality on this general level is not, not very useful, but I tried to, to put it in so far in the context as Neurath, at least I f find this an interesting diagnosis, to say there's a, a special, let's say, constellation in which individuals and societies are sort of deprived of, uh, of uh, authorities which help in cases where we, we cannot really uh, say uh, what the optimum option would be, uh, they are so helpless. And, they, uh, and we have, and I think now, this is, this is an interesting um, a point um, in, in his approach, that um, uh, we, should, we should think of action based on a scientific freedom, it's a very special case. This is normally not at all the, uh, uh, the case, but this does not mean that we have to be irrational because we have to be aware of the, of the, um, well, of, of, of the limits. And I think that, in fact, um, of course, there's a very strong relation with, uh, with, with uh, debates in economics. And in my view, uh, Neurath uh, wanted to show that the planning, uh, um, a planning, measure, planning measurements in society um, um, would be <coughs> caught in a wrong, in a wrong um, let's say, um, trend. Uh, if it was to, it, if it was led by the idea of optimization, it's not possible. It's, it, it is, you, you have, you, you, and this would also be the idea, that there's a theoretical insight. We know what the best option would be for our planning measurements, and this is not the case. Instead, he thought that the specific expertise of the, of the social scientist in his case would be uh, developing different scenarios which, uh, which are, let's say, um, uh, offered 
to the, po the political uh, players and discussed with them. He thought of this as a sort of interaction, I think. And he, uh, in, I think in his, in his view, the, the political side, uh, sort of, uh, the economist has, uh, has more the, the role of, of, uh, of somebody he has, who has the tools to, to develop more scenarios than we normally think about and then bring them into the discussion. And uh, so, uh, so I, um, I, I agree that this, is, that this is the context. And of course, even this, what, what I referred to uh, in my last part, uh, even his ideas of uh, his um, uh, method of visualization has this aim. No? Of, course, uh, of course, in a limited, uh, in a limited space. But well, thank you very much. Are there other questions? Yes, yeah, thanks. Uh, the question is possibly a bit related to the, the first one, uh, because I, I found it very interesting that you <clears throat> contrasted this pseudo-rationalism notion, which is extremely famous and was used by Neurot in, in all kinds of, of uh, uh, citations, with, with, uh, with rationality. And, 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 and you, you said that, that there is a, a, there's not just this notion of pseudo-rationalism, but also a positive uh, yeah. notion of, of rationalism in Neurath. And I, I was just mm, unable to, to get exactly what kind of, of rationality notion this might be. For example, in comparison with, with Carnap. Because in the case of Carnap, if, if you uh, call Carnap a logical empiricist, then it's kind of simple to understand why and in what sense he's a rationalist, because this is the logic part of, of the story. So he's, uh, he says, we do not need any longer all these, these, these strong notions of ration, ra rationalism, of course, but we have to reason logically. And insofar, uh, we have to be rationalists. But this is a story I, I, I didn't find in Neurath, at least not in, in, in such a... Uh, 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 in such a uh, positive sense. So, uh, what, what, what is the, the, the rationalism part in Neurath if it is not uh, logical reasoning? Um, it's, a, it's a good question. Uh, of course, you are, you are right. Uh, uh, Neurath was even skeptical about too, too much formalism. He was very unhappy uh, about the, the trend in the 1930s and 40s that logical uh, empiricism would be reduced more and more to, to, to logical analysis of, uh, of uh, science. And, he was, and this was one of the reasons why, why he, he wanted to, to, uh, uh, well, to empower the historical and sociological perspective. Um, uh, I think that uh, that um, well, there there is this quote: uh, "True rationalism is uh, is this. It's, it's in fact it's a bit Kantian, uh, <laughs> I would say. Uh, no, it's uh, it's being aware of how far uh, uh, of how far you come with a theor with theoretical insight and try to see as exactly as possible how far this goes and uh, as." Uh, uh, Carl um, mentioned, this is very important for him in the theory of planning and in theory of economics, because he, he argued against the idea of the lust maximum of util utilitarianism, that, there, that it would be a good idea to, to, to take this as an ideal. He, he argued against, um, let's say, measuring, measuring different, uh, different uh, actions by, by, by monetary units, by, by units of pleasure and so on, because he thought we should should not think of, um, of, let's say, decision, rational decisions in this maximizing and optimizing uh, uh, um, uh, framework because, because uh, this is a sort of, this is, um, let's say, it's a negative, it's, a, it, it's more of a negative input into, into uh, our thinking about we, what we, we are able to to, to do in relation to between our theoretical insight and uh, and, concre uh, and concrete planning. I think one one uh, it, 
it is it is not a positive idea of rationalism in the sense that you can you can spell out certain features and then do you know this is a rational this is now rational um, uh, guaranteed uh, rationally but uh, but it's uh, it's more a behavior that is that deals with the, with the problem of, of how to, to get to the best insight and how to use it. Uh, and there being aware of the, of the constraints, the social ones, the historical ones, and so on. Okay. Okay. Um, so. One last question. Thank you. Post-factual is something we um, kind of hear pretty often in media these days. Uh, you mentioned the Descartes' definite truth. Um, as scientists, we are often caught between dualities, um, rationalism versus empiricism, I would say. Um, can you say something about the role of truth or facts about the world from a perspective of today's philosophy of science? Are there bounds? <laughs> this is a big question. Uh, okay. Uh, well, there are. Um, this is a. This is too big a question for me to uh, to uh, to answer. I think that. Uh, well, um, there are many different approaches to to the uh, to to uh, the um, to the concept of truth and uh, and during the whole history of uh, philosophy of science during the 20th century uh, it was one of the most contested uh, uh, questions what role truth plays in for um, for our philosophical um, conception of science um, of science, so I uh, I think that um, that this is not directly related to the discussions about post factualism. Uh, I th I when when I prepared the, this talk, I thought, uh, but I couldn't develop it that that the, the approach which is um, um, of, of both. Uh, both authors, which uh, I addressed, of, of Neurath and of Collins, uh, could be quite helpful to address questions um, that arise in this uh, um, in these debates on post-factual, because on the one hand they accept that there are no simple facts which from which we we derive our theoretical insight, something like this. There is there is a there is always a constructive moment in it, and so on. And on the other hand, they try to think about what the specific way um, 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 science, um, science orders and reconstructs the reality in which we live can um, contribute to a public understanding of our world, which is not at all so. Uh, uh, doesn't go without saying how, they, how this uh, this would 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 work, and therefore I think. Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, um, uh, I, I couldn't uh, say much about this. Uh, uh, in in Colin, Colin's approach, um, uh, there is a very interesting um, <coughs> setting in which he argues that in democracies it is very important to have in public decision making the type of input that science uh, produces. This does not mean that uh, this input can uh, be, let's say, the, the reference for the last uh, decision. This is not because this is not the case because there is a there is a, uh, a social setting in which also uh, also um, uh, discussions are legitimate about whether or not one wants to to apply or not apply certain certain um, um, results that science has has produced. This must be possible in principle, but it must. Must be openly discussed, and the, and it, it is uh, and what what he wanted to show is that there's a difference between, let's say, taking scientific results uh, as very important input in the discussion, and nevertheless say, well, although we say we we have this input, we can't do it because we don't have the money, we 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 have different priorities, and so on, and. 
uh, this this uh, way to, to deal with it, and this, the other uh, the difference would be to the other way to deal with it, namely to say, well, this is just one opinion amongst many others, and and these are these are not scientific facts, even uh, even uh, when they are produced by the best uh, the best knowledge we we have. This is just one opinion uh, amongst others, and he distinguishes between these two settings, which I think is very useful because because uh, there one can uh, see more clearly that, of course, even before our talking about post-factual um, uh, the, the post factual era, uh, politics never was so uh, uh, was based on facts. This is not not the case. So, so there's a sort of mis misconception of the whole situation quite often involved, I think. And uh, and I think that that from both Neurath's and Collins' point of view, one has uh, let's say more more instruments to think about how this relation could could work uh, and uh, and and uh, well and as um, as Carl Milford said before it is normally it would be a wrong idea to think about uh, the result even the best result of a theoretical insight as what 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 can lead political action there is a much more complicated relation between and uh, to to fight this I think pseudo rationalism, which which, uh, which Nayat meant, but also what we see now uh, today, would be to be very clear about about this interesting relationship and not not so, so to simplify, simplify um, it in the one or in the other direction, which I find find quite interesting in Collins, uh, Collins with these two regimes. Okay, let's thank Professor Nemeth again.